welcome to the new fly fisher. Today we're going to be wet wading in the middle of Arkansas. That's right, wet wading in Arkansas with a chap called Dwayne Hara, one of the best guides in this area. Dwayne has developed a pattern called the River Slick Minnow and that's what we're going to be using to catch the bass that are right behind me. Stay tuned, you'll pick up some great pointers on how you can catch fish. That was awesome. Let him go back to live another day. These are extremely strong fish. Here you go. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah, good fish, good fish. example of the family Heptogeneidae, uh, very flat music, sweet music. This is why you need a lot of backing. This week, the new fly fisher crew is fly fishing for smallmouth just outside of Cotter, Arkansas. Our guide for today is Dwayne Hayda a certified casting instructor with the Federation of Fly Fishers and a fly fishing teacher in conjunction with the Arkansas Fish and Game Commission. His friendly ways and fly fishing expertise will make this a great trip. The smallmouth bass is generally green with dark vertical bands and the upper jaw does not extend beyond the eye. Smallmouth bass reside in cool and clear streams with gravel substrates. In small streams, a fish's activity may be limited to just one stream pool or extended into several. Spawning occurs in the spring when the water temperature reaches 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Smallmouth bass can be found countrywide with exception of Florida and Louisiana, which apparently are free of smallmouth bass. The smallmouth bass is usually found in rocky and sandy areas in moderately shallow water near rocks or submerged drop-offs. It is less often associated with dense growths of aquatic vegetation than largemouth bass. Get a shot of that guy. <laughs> Monster, huh? Tell me about this fish. This is a native species we have in these creeks. It's called an Ozark bass. It's a type of panfish that, uh, very similar to your probably rock bass that you mm -hmm. have up there, but it, this is a southern version of that. They get up to maybe about three quarters of a pound would be a large one. I'll let them go. There are about five or six nice big smallmouth up here, but man, they're... See them? I can see them. There's some suckers, but there's some big smallmouth in there with them. There's five or six at Canadian size. Huh? <laughs> oh, that's a better one. Still the wrong species. Or Ozark bass. <laughs> Don't get a bass, huh? Another fat rock bass. You may want supper. A smallmouth diet consists mainly of insects, crayfish and minnows. During times of famine, they will often cannibalize their own species. Get a hit. This river is loaded with a lot of uh, natural minnows that are called river slicks. And they have kind of a coppery golden brown back, a white belly. And in clear water, minnows tend to be very translucent, or they appear that way to the fish. So I choose to tie my uh, river slick lead-eyed minnow with uh, craft fur. It's a synthetic material, it's acrylic hair, and it has a lot more movement. It has a nice silhouette of the minnow, and in the water as it bounces along the bottom, it really uh, is a very effective job of imitating these bottom bouncing type of minnows. When you're retrieving this fly, is there anything special that I have to do in order to get fish? Show me what you do. Well, this particular type of minnow lives very close to the bottom. This is the minnow that you always see in the shoals and riffles flashing on its side. And so I 
tie it with a weight so that it will stay right down on the bottom and the hook rides up and you're going to retrieve it in a strip retrieve type um, retrieve like that so it pretty much hops and bounces along the bottom and has that nice uh, flash in the sun there and then little ripples to imitate that minnow. Whenever you encounter large numbers of minnows in a concentrated area, this is a sure sign that smallmouth bass are nearby. Herding of minnows is common among predatory fish. The minnows are forced into a small area and the bass will then feed voraciously on the school. Generally, you know, the minnow that's a little bit um, scared or one that is uh, slightly uh, injured or something like that is the one that gets picked on. So I'm going to get my fly down through the bait ball and a whole lot like what we do if you're ever saltwater fishing for stripers or bluefish or something like that. Yeah, we've got a little blitz going on. Of the, you know, smallmouth, here's a big wad of bait just kind of circling down through there. I'm going to get right in the middle of it, let my fly sink down under the naturals. Oh, 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 oh. What a, what a tiger, huh? I mean, he put a haul on there. And there he goes again. Those minnows are coming out of the water about feet. This little river slick streamer that I'm throwing, um, just kind of keep it and make it act like the naturals and bring it through there. We ought to get What I'm doing now is I have Wayne's fly on here, his river slick minnow, and I'm looking for fish that are busting on the surface, and just like striper fishing, I'm going to try to drop the fly right into the busting minnows. This technique also works for white bass. The problem is, this area is a lot bigger than some of the stuff we fished earlier on today, and I'm having a hard time adjusting to making long casts at a very small target. And I'm, oh. When casting any weighted fly or sinking line system, open loops are desirable and safer. The wide loops keep the fly away from hitting you or damaging your equipment. So one minute I see them there and I get the fly on top of them and it's so hard to predict which way they're going. There's just, there's minnows going everywhere. It's awesome fishing though. There we go. There he goes. He's over there. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Yep, yep. Oh, 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 God. Now he's over there now. Whew. They're covering about, oh, no. They're covering, this is wild. They're, they're covering about eight feet. They're like splash and they splash. And I just can't get the fly on top of them. There he goes again. Whew. Right in front of me, look at that, look at the little rascals. <laughs> hey? Thing is about as fat and stuffed with minnows as you can come by. Excellent. Pretty little dude. So that's not a fish from, you know, spawning, that's a fish that's uh, just stuffed full of all the minnows in the yep. world he can eat. He's throwing up minnows as we look at it. Oh yeah, look at that belly on him. So we'll let him go. Okay, right. okay, let's get another Hold one on, there. On. So thanks for showing me how it's done. <laughs> okay, you bet. A little bit wet. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> My name is Dwayne Hayden. I guide here in the Ozarks on the White River in Crooked Creek for smallmouth bass and trout. And three of my tips that will help you in improving your success for smallmouth bass in clear water streams, use longer leaders, much like, you, much like you would do for trout fishing. Also, scale your fly pattern size down a little bit smaller than what you would use in normal fishing situations. If you'll scale down your leader and tippet uh, size, and also the fly pattern size, I think those two tips, along with the fact that 
the minnows fish the direction the minnows are, are running or, or escaping from the bass. What I mean by that, we're fishing an area here where uh, schools of minnows are facing upstream, bringing your fly through those minnows to act like a natural but somewhat different than the schools of minnows will entice a strike. Try these tips and see if they don't improve your success in fly fishing in clear water streams for smallmouth bass. You can instill a strike by shaking the tip of the rod to give your fly an erratic movement. This will give the minnow an illusion of being hurt or fleeing. Injured minnows are always the first to be eaten by predatory bass. What do you eat? A little river flick minnow? Oh, all right. Hold on, I got a bass. <laughs> it's extremely important to get off the water at first sign of thunder or lightning. Seek shelter immediately and wait out the storm. Do not seek shelter under a tree. Return to your vehicle or the nearest building. I think it's probably a good, good day to get out of the water. I'd hate to get my death on camera. How about you? Now I'm going to take you to the Willy Wonka of the fly fishing world. That's Watsu Fly in Mountain Home, Arkansas. If you tie flies, you don't want to miss this. So Joe, I tie about 30,000 flies a year and I dye my own stuff. How do you maintain this kind of consistency for this? I mean, this is like Christmas time for a fly tile. <laughs> it, it's it, unbelievable. It is difficult. Uh, one of the problems we have is red deer hair dies differently than red chicken feathers, and red chicken feathers dies differently than uh, red deer belly. So for every color, you got to have a separate recipe for every different substrate. And you have to dye in large quantities to make sure you get a big enough batch so you've dyed enough of the same color. When you order a sweater and you buy yarn to you knit a sweater, they say buy from the same dye lot. So, you know, if I increase the dye lot size, that also helps my, my consistency in color. And what do you look for in a good bucktail? I mean, what, why do you decide this is a good one, this is a bad one? Oh, size mostly. The, the bigger they are, they're usually the better quality they are. A lot of stuff in, in fly tying materials is that way. Yeah. Larger is better quality. Not always, but... Now, is it difficult to dye this lot, com to dye a bucktail compared to, say, the deer hair, the actual height? <laughs> They're just different. They just die a little bit different. You know, the, 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 all the deer products are fairly similar in how they die. But uh, to keep up with the bucktails, I have to dye and dry and process about 600 every working day. 600 a yeah. day. Yeah. Okay. Maybe you can show us how you dye them. All right. Thank you. Yeah. This is a washing machine. And this came out of a high school somewhere. And is a, uh, that's a 200-pound washer, which means it'll wash 200 pounds of dry laundry. It'll also wash 1,500 deer tails. And that's what we process our deer tails in. I'll load this up the night before with deer tails, and then we'll bleach them the next day and make them, most of these will be for white. So from here, it's, they're washed, then you bleach them, and then you dye them. And that's what I'm going to see next, is the dye stuff. Yep. Excellent. This has got to be the biggest candy floss maker I have seen in my life. You could probably make a big batch of spaghetti in there anyway. <laughs> but uh, this is one of our dye vats. This is about a 90-gallon job. And we'll run uh, just about everything we dye through a dye vat just like this. OK, I give in. What is it? That is a uh, red squirrel, also known as a pine squirrel. Now, I know a little bit about animals, and I've never seen something like this in the wild. So when you're dyeing this, is it the same as your other products? You just bleach them out if you have to, and then put them in a dye bath, and then through a dryer and wash For them out? Pretty much. These guys have a very thin skin, and they make excellent tiny zonkers because of that thin, supple skin. But also because of that thin, supple skin, they're, uh, they're fragile. Okay. So again, they have to be tanned correctly, and so they'll, hold the, uh, so they'll hold the heat. This is your finished product, ready mm -hmm. for packaging. These were laid out this afternoon, and they're still, they're still a little bit supple. That skin will harden and dry in, a, in about a day or two, and then they'll be ready. So, How long do they have to stay in this big drying room that you have in the back? Usually every Monday morning when the guys come in, this drying room gets emptied. And this stuff may be dried a little bit sooner than that, but that's kind of the schedule we work on. Marabu, unbelievable. I've never seen anything like this in my life before. How 
many packages of marabou do you sell in a year? In one style of marabou, like your basic quarter ounce marabou, which is blood quill marabou, we'll, we'll sell between 80 and 100,000 packs, 100, something like that. And does most of that go to fly fishermen or spin fishermen tying up jigs? No. What, what do you think? Almost all goes to fly fishermen. Fly fishermen. Yeah, there, we do sell uh, to some manufacturers in bulk. Mm -hmm. So there are there. Are, I sell to fly manufacturers in bulk, and I also sell to some jig manufacturers in bulk too. But our whole business is really geared specifically toward fly fishing. And if we have extra left over, then we can sell it off to the jig manufacturers and, and folks like that. What's the most popular color? Black. The stuff behind yes. Yeah, I love black because when I when I mess up a color, I can always dye it black. Dye black. <laughs> and you never dye black first. No. If I have a list of colors to do, do I'll do black works. last. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. And thank goodness it sells because if it didn't, I'd be in trouble. Hi, my name is Joe Schmucker. I'm the production manager for Wopsy Fly, and here's a good tip for storing fly tying materials. There are two types of mothballs to use. There's a naphtalene ball, which is your classic grandma's mothball, and there's a paradichlorobenzene. And paradichlorobenzene usually comes in a crystalline form. Uh, both will work. The naphtalene will last longer, but the paradichlorobenzene will kill the moths quicker and more intensely. And that's it. This is one huge bag of dubbing. Hendrickson dubbing? That's for Hendrickson Pink. How many flies will this make? That is uh, about 15 pounds of dry fly dubbing, and I think it'll make about 1.4 million. At least that's the way we crunch the numbers for a size 14. Thank you. <laughs> You're I don't even know what to say. Yeah. Well, it should be snowing. It should be snowing size 14 Hendersons sometimes. Yeah. Thank you very much for <laughs> your time. You're welcome, Ian. Saw one go back in the rocks there. There's a green sunfish. <laughs> Not exactly the fish we're looking for. One of the other native species we have here, a green sunfish. He liked the little minnow. Here's one right here. Still got a little bit of bright sun here. You know, there's not a cloud in the sky at all right now, and so these fish are kind of sensitive to any type of movement or it's going to be a little bit spooky anyway with all this uh, bright sky. All these fish are still laying up underneath these ledges. Oh, host, oh, host. Man, there's some good ones there. Kind of a long, kind of a worm leech type fly anyway. You see it there? A common mistake is to start stripping the fly as soon as it hits the water. Wait and allow the fly to sink to the bottom, then strip it back with erratic movements. The idea is to make the fly look like a wounded minnow. Comes a good one. Holes, several in here. Here comes one. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. Nice smallmouth. Oh, hallelujah! All right. Long time coming, but he's a nice one. Pretty little native Neosho strain smallmouth. I 
That'll work. <laughs> All right. Ate the little minnow. Okay, well, thank you, fish. Hey, it's one of those those like bass, but it's a nice one. Chunky Ozark bass. They like to get right up in those boulders. Man, that's right where he was, right up under that big rock. Hmm. Crooked Creek, Arkansas, thoroughly exhausted, great day, couldn't have asked for a better day. I mean, unbelievable scenery. We saw some big fish, really, really tough to get them. We hooked one, maybe two, I lost a big one. You gotta do this. This is absolutely unbelievable fishing. Hope you enjoyed it. For more information on today's show and other shows we have, visit us on the World Wide Web at www.thenewflyfisher.com. Hi, I'm Tom Rosenbauer. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you like this and you want to see more, subscribe and you can get all our weekly uploads. The new Fly Fisher is made possible thanks to the Canadian Fly Fisher Magazine, Scientific Anglers, Mastering the Sport with Science, Islander Precision Reels, 